1 Corinthians uh, chapter 1. I'm going to read from verse 17 to the end of the chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus who has become for us wisdom from God. That is our righteousness, holiness and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this astonishing passage of scripture that speaks to us, to our need as your people today. Father, by your spirit, help me to preach faithfully this word and apply it to our hearts and our minds that we might know you better and love you more and live our lives to your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Here at Burwood Presbyterian Church, we believe in the priority of preaching. Preaching is our third core value in our list of 12 core values that we have as a church. We've been looking at them over the past few weeks, haven't we? Core value number one is the gospel. The gospel is the good news that through Christ, the power of God's kingdom has entered history to renew the whole world. When we believe and rely on Jesus' record rather than ours for our relationship to God, that kingdom power comes on us and begins to work through us, as we saw from uh, Romans chapter 1 a couple of weeks ago. Then last week, Derek preached to us on our second core value of prayer. Prayer is a vital part of the Christian life. There is no formula for prayer. Prayer is talking to God, thanking him, praising him, confessing our sins, asking him to supply our needs and the needs of others. Privately and corporately, as families and as a church, our Heavenly Father invites us to bring our prayers and petitions to him with thanksgiving. For this reason, we draw near to him with full assurance of faith, knowing he hears our prayers and will answer according to our need. A little later on this morning, we're going to have another special time of prayer because of the importance of the decisions our nation is about to make next Saturday. And then our third core value, which we're looking at this morning, is preaching. Preaching. The public proclamation of God's word is an essential part of our church's life and worship. This ministry may take many forms, including preaching, children's talks, Bible reading and scripture in song. Such gifts may be used in the proper circumstances by both men and women for the building up of his church. However, when preaching to a mixed audience during a worship service, We believe the scriptures teach this should only be undertaken by suitably gifted and qualified men. This honours the headship Christ over his people. So then, this is our topic for today. We believe in the priority of preaching. 
The gift of preaching and teaching is God's way of applying the truth of his word powerfully to the hearts and minds of his people. And it is absolutely necessary to the health of your church. Make sure your pastor is a preaching pastor because if God's word is not faithfully preached, you will starve and your church will starve and eventually the church will die. Feed my sheep, said Jesus to Peter. And he meant it. Feed my sheep. Preach the word, said Paul to Timothy. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Preach the word. Feed the flock. Preach or perish. That's what I find in the Bible. There is a direct connection between the preaching of God's word and the spiritual health of God's people, which means you and me. That's why if you look at verse 17, as we begin looking at our passage today, hopefully your Bible is open. It's a good thing to do as we look at the Bible. In verse 17, Paul insists that preaching is his primary responsibility as an apostle. Even more important than baptising new believers. So that's got to tell you something, doesn't it? Look at what he says in verse 17. Christ did not send me to baptise but to preach the gospel. Look at verse 23. He says, but we preach Christ crucified. And Paul makes many other similar statements, not only in Corinthians but in his other letters as well. If you look at the book of Acts, when they first set aside the, uh, the apostles and they set aside the deacons, they said, we, we, the apostles, need to focus on prayer and the preaching of God's word. And so we see how important preaching is. Is. Friends, I believe in the power of preaching because I believe that the Bible is God's word. If you don't believe the Bible is God's word, you're going to have trouble preaching. The Bible is the word of God and as we preach it, God speaks to us. When God's word is preached, we actually hear God speaking to us through the preacher. Yes, we do need to be wise about it and yes, the gift does need to be tested. I understand that. But when God's word is faithfully preached, okay, when God's word is faithfully preached, something miraculous happens. God speaks to us immediately in a way that brings the truth of God's word home to us, head and heart, powerfully and personally. Sometimes God will even speak directly into your situation through the preacher without, about things that nobody else knows about. And even the preacher is unaware of what God is saying to you through him. It's true, God's word is living and active and Christ, by his spirit, will walk around the church touching different people in different ways according to your point of, point of need. It's the power of preaching and we must keep preaching as a top priority in our church. Spirit-empowered preaching is God's unique, effective and gracious way of speaking to his people as a church together. There is something that happens when we gather together that doesn't happen when you're listening on YouTube or somewhere else to sermons alone. It's edifying and it's helpful. But the church gathered and the word preached is something that God has set aside to speak to us together. It is unique because all the elements must be together in one place at the one time. God, through his word, by his spirit, speaking to us as his people through the preacher. 
It's something that happens to, for us and in us by God's Spirit together. Now, we are all prone to sin. We're all prone to times of doubt and discouragement. And yet through preaching, God is able to call us back to himself and lead us on in life together. Biblical preaching is powerful and effective, able to restore sick churches to health and healthy churches to wholeness. For example, take a look again at the church in Corinth. What a mess it was. I wonder if you know much of the history of the church of Corinth. Well, it was young, it was energetic and it was foolish. It was full of life and it was full of problems. The people at Corinth prided themselves on their wisdom and their spiritual gifts like prophecy and speaking in tongues, but at the same time they dared to question the Apostle Paul's ability. In fact, they looked down on his unimpressive style of preaching. It doesn't take us long to realise, as you read this letter of 1 Corinthians, that despite outward appearances of being vital and vibrant, in fact there were some very serious problems in the home, in the spiritual home at Corinth. Arrogance, pride, boastfulness, selfishness, disrespect, disunity, serious sexual sin. It was a complex church full of ordinary men and women like you and me who needed to hear the gospel preached. But the preaching of the gospel always involves a great paradox and this paradox is also hinted at in verse 17. This is my second point for today. Notice what Paul says. He says, Christ did not send me to baptise but to preach the gospel. So yes, that's the priority of preaching. That's true but notice what he adds. He says, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Now that's a surprising uh, exception, isn't it? Clarification. He's telling us that the effectiveness of preaching doesn't actually depend on the preacher, but on God. You see, public speaking is not the same as preaching. It's easy to stand up and tell people what they want to hear. It's easy to tell jokes and make you feel good about yourself. But preaching the Bible plainly and clearly is a very difficult task. And so Paul insists here, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. A faithful preacher must always be stepping down, stepping down, allowing God's word to speak into my life before I can proclaim what I have heard from God and learnt from God to you. In Paul's day, you see, there were many professional speakers who used to do the rounds of the cities. That's how they made money. They were kind of like travelling circuses today and they were entertainment. And people come and see what the travelling speaker had to say. And sometimes they would be religious speakers or sometimes they'd be boasting of the fights that they'd won and they'd tell of all the marvellous victories that they had, the wisdom that they'd learned as they'd journeyed around the world, the sights they'd seen and the places they'd been. As I said, it's a form of entertainment and people go out and pay their money and listen to the stories that were told. But the gospel is not entertainment. The gospel is not entertainment and preaching must never treat God's word lightly because it is the word of God. The precious, living, life-changing word of God which we have. Listen to what Paul says over in chapter 2. This is actually continuing the passage, but I want to pick it up and just complete the picture here. Listen to what he says in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. One topic 
One person, one Lord, one God, one Saviour, one King, one Jesus. And he goes on to say, I came to you in weakness and in fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words. Notice. But with a demonstration of the Spirit's power so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom but on God's power. Christ-centred preaching glorifies God rather than the preacher. I don't want you to listen to me. I don't want you to see me. I want you to hear and listen to Jesus. Christ-centred preaching destroys all the strongholds of human pride. For Christ-centred preaching believes, as I said, that the Bible itself is the very word of God. And this is my duty, to communicate that word to you as a messenger of the living word. And this is where all the tension is created as the word is preached. For it is true that we as human beings are not comfortable being spoken to by God. Let's have a look again at verse 18. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. And so to receive this word is an act of faith, isn't it? It's a moving of God's spirit in our hearts to remove the veil of of disinterest and to awaken us and to arouse our interest in who it is that is speaking to us. It's an act of faith to listen to God's word preached. I mean listen to God's word preached. The same message can be heard in two completely different ways. For those who are perishing, it sounds like brainless, dumb stupidity. Morally repugnant, socially unacceptable. And that's why Israel flowers in trouble, isn't it? The moral gatekeepers of our society, the high priests of Rugby Australia who are servants of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, Alan Joyce, CEO of Qantas, well, they've been told to sack Israel for Now, this is a very worrying development for our society. They actually found him guilty of a high-level breach of their inclusiveness policy. It's ironic, isn't it? a high-level breach of their inclusiveness policy. And when you think what some of the other footballers get up to, isn't it disgraceful that you can lose your job? And remember, he's also a part-time preacher. He didn't go around saying things when, uh, when he was wearing the, the, the football jersey. He has another life to live and he tweets a response as a person, a private individual, And they join that together and say, no, you cannot play rugby anymore. It's a direct attack on our religious freedom. And if he doesn't appeal it, I pray that he does. And if that is not overturned, you can see what that means. You will potentially lose your job for talking in your texts, uh, for putting stuff on Facebook uh, about what you believe as an individual private person. This is the test case for our nation. It's a direct attack on our religious freedom, but it shouldn't surprise us. In Rome today, there is an ancient piece of graffiti etched on a wall on the Palatine Hill where the emperors used to live. It's been dated to the first century AD, this piece of graffiti. In other words, somebody was etching it on the wall, this picture mocking Christianity, outside the Roman palace without, within 70 years of Jesus' death. And this, uh, here it is. Let's have a look at it. It's clever, isn't it? 
I suppose the person who drew it must have thought it was pretty funny. A soldier standing in front of a cross. But notice the man on the cross has a donkey's head. And underneath you can still make out the punchline. It says, Alexamenos worships his God. <laughs> Alexamenos worships his God. This fool of a man is worshipping an ass of a God. In Rome, within 70 years of Jesus' death, somebody etched that on a wall on the emperor's palace. But Alexamenos is our brother in Christ, isn't he? For him, the gospel was the power of God for salvation and he believed it and he was saved. And if we were standing in his shoes 1,900 years ago, this cartoon could very easily have been drawn of us. David worships his God. Ross worships his God. Manuk worships her God. In the eyes of the world, we are fools for Christ. In the eyes of the world, we are dumb and dangerous morons who believe in a crucified God, a God who judges sin and sends people to hell, but who also saves them by the message of the cross. I'm not telling you anything new unless you're hearing it for the first time. But I can see why some people do get upset when we try to tell them about sin and judgment and the grace of God because it doesn't fit their narrative. They insist that they've done nothing wrong. They claim that same-sex attracted boys are going to commit suicide when they hear what Israel Folau said. And it's all because of you evil Christians, you nasty people. You Christians have had it too good for too long. Where is your God when little children get hurt by pedophile priests? Where is your God when soldiers move in for the kill? Where is your God when people starve to death, die of cancer, suffer from all kinds of evil every day? Where is your God then? How can you say to me, I need Jesus as Lord of my life? Doesn't your God love me for who I am? Now, these are tough questions, aren't they? Tough questions and, and I confess I feel the pressure. I'm sure Chris does as well. Am I really worshipping the true and living God? Am I really preaching the only truth that can set you free? Is Jesus really the only answer to the problems of our world? Or am I being a moron too? Have I been fooled by the message of the cross? You see, it's good to test our own motives from time to time, make sure we know what and why we believe. It seems to me that true preaching can only really begin after we've made this admission of personal guilt before God and before man. Whatever sin, whatever hypocrisy you can see in me, and I'm sure you'll find some if you look, I don't deny it. I know my own brokenness. I have no right to stand here and preach to you now. And yet here I am, here I stand as one who has been called by God to preach his truth to a needy world and this is what I must do. For God does not want anyone to perish but everyone to come to repentance. He does not take pleasure in anyone's death. On the contrary, God rejoices in every sinner who is saved. And this is my third point for today. It's about God's good pleasure in preaching. You see, the Spirit of God is present in the preaching of his word, revealing to us a true wisdom that comes from above. And this wisdom cannot be attained by science, it cannot be bought with money, cannot be discovered by clever philosophy, cannot be controlled by crafted speeches. You can't put it in a box and label it. The mystery is that even a little child can hear and understand this wisdom of God and believe and be saved. So in verse 20, where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, 
God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. How wonderful God is that he should bring his word alive in our hearts through preaching. What human wisdom could ever imagine that God would love us to death literally to give us eternal life? Why does God do this? Well, thank goodness he does. Thank goodness he does. Ultimately, God does it because he is Lord. And it's his good pleasure to bring, as I say, to bring us to heaven on our knees. To humble us that he might lift us up in his good time. Look at verse 22. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block for Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. And I thank Ross for his kids' talk this morning because I wanted to say to you, just picture it, that wonderful verse there, picture what's going on here. A loving father teaching his child how to arm wrestle and the father's just got the little finger out and the child's going for it all they can but the father's weakness is stronger than the child's strength. Or learning how to read and the child is sort of C-A-T, cat, The father's vocabulary is like a dictionary. He's got all the knowledge that's there and yet sitting down and teaching a child how to read. The foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. What a wonderful God we have. And so Paul says, we preach Christ crucified. We will not be distracted from this All important message. I must talk to you about the cross. I must tell you about the Saviour who dies and yet lives so that you can live with God. Back in the day when Paul wrote this letter to the Corinthians, he knew there were some in the church who were beginning to backslide because they were facing the same kind of pressures that you and I face today. So I appeal to you now, don't be ashamed of the gospel and don't be ashamed of the cross of Jesus. This is our hope as his people today that as Christ now is, risen and ascended, so shall we one day be. Death reminds us of our fallenness and our frailty as human beings. It reminds us of what we must all face one day soon. We've been reminded there have been a couple of funerals that we've heard of even in the past week. Death reminds us of what we must all face one day soon. But Jesus stands before us to remind us that he's been there too and has won the victory over sin, death and the devil and risen to eternal life. He has conquered, he has had the victory. This is the true message of the cross and this is the foolishness of God that he should die in our place. And the wise man and the scholar and the philosopher of this age laugh at us and they mock our faith and they tell us to grow up and stop believing in fairy tales but the truth is they are the ones who are being deceived. Many years ago now a man named John Chrysostom said this, he said, the world behaves like a madman who in his sickness rejects the medicine which alone can cure him of his disease. I heard the story of the vegans this week whose, whose baby they fed only strict vegan food. What a terrible story that is when they had the food the whole time. Oh, it's a terrible story. The message of the cross stands opposed to the wisdom of the world to frustrate it, destroy it and bring it to nothing while at the same time turning many hearts to faith in Jesus. So this is my fourth point for today, which is about God's good purpose in preaching. This is where we come in. 
It's all about God's bringing glory to himself in our lives. God bringing glory to himself in our lives. By the preaching of God's word, his greatness, his majesty and his holiness is revealed with divine power and authority. Have a look at verse 26. This is wonderful stuff. I love this part of the passage. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. Now, this passage of scripture makes my heart sing, just to think of it. I've got the questions up there to reflect on as I was thinking about, who am I that God should treat me so kindly? Who am I? Who am I that my Lord should suffer and die for me? Why does God love me so much? It's just like the song says, we didn't sing it today, but you know, nothing can I boast in. My life is scarred with sin. My works are filthy rags. No merit can I bring. Yet mercy filled Christ's heart. Love took him to the tree. It's grace alone which saves me. Christ's blood that sets me free. What a fantastic summary of the truth that is. Singing the gospel. Christ is my righteousness. He is my rock of salvation upon whom I stand and in whom I shelter from God's wrath. Christ is my righteousness. Secondly, Christ is my holiness. He washes me clean and he covers over all my guilt and shame completely. My sins are like scarlet, but he washes them white as snow. Christ is my righteousness, Christ is my holiness and third, Christ is my redemption, my redeemer. He pays the price to set me free. He ransoms me from sin and death. He was pierced for my transgressions and crushed for my iniquity. Therefore, as it is written and as our passage today finishes, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. I want to come back now to our core value of preaching. Let me read it to you again. The public proclamation of God's word is an essential part of our church's life and worship. Now this ministry may take many forms including preaching, children's talks, Bible reading and scripture in song. Such gifts may be used in the proper circumstances by both men and women for the building up of his church. However, when preaching to a mixed audience during a worship service, we believe the scriptures teach this should only be undertaken by suitably gifted and qualified men. This honours the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ over his people. Now, just a couple of points to finish up. First of all, why do I say that women ought not to preach to a mixed audience, that is, to an audience of men and women gathered together in the context of a worship service? Well, this is a big topic. I'm only going to say a few things this morning. First, I believe that this limitation that God has said exists because of God's unique giftings of us individually as men and women. He wants us to be equal but different and that difference reflects in this area of leadership. It's also because God has placed order in creation as well as order in the home and order in the church, all of which actually arises out of God's own orderly nature as the triune God. Remember, we believe in one God and yet in three persons, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, but the Son always lives in submission to the Father and the Spirit is always sent by the Father and the Son. So we have this equality and submission within the eternal relationships of God and that works itself out as he creates us, male and female, and gives us differences and distinctions that we can be united together even as different uh, uh, sexes, male and female. In other words, I'm saying I believe there are deep theological reasons why it is good for a husband to lead his family in the knowledge and fear of the Lord. And yes, I know, and I'm sure you can think of exceptions as well as I can because we live in a broken world. 
But there is a pattern here which God has established and I believe the pattern is valid and God-honouring and it carries over into the teaching ministry of the church as Paul makes clear in the verse I've, I've quite referenced here, I think I did, yeah, 1 Timothy 2.12, I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man, rather she is to remain quiet. The context is a worship service. If this is a hot topic for you, perhaps it is, I urge you to look up this excellent article from John Piper's Desiring God website, Women Teaching Men, How Far is Too Far? And that article is written by a woman and it's very clear. So that's a good place to go if you've got more questions about what I'm saying here. In conclusion then, today I've been preaching all about preaching which is our third core value as a church. Preaching needs to be a priority in our church because if God's word is not faithfully preached, then you will starve, the church will starve, eventually the church will die. Preaching, though, is not the same as public speaking. Preaching is God's unique, effective and gracious way of speaking to his people as a church together. And now to finish, I'd like to give you some quick tips on how to listen to a sermon. Because I've been doing all the talking, you've been doing all the listening, there are still skills in learning to listen well. It's worth thinking about. Am I listening well to what I hear on a Sunday? How can I do better at listening to God speaking through my preacher on a Sunday morning and learning from what is preached? I've got seven suggestions. Here they are. How to listen to a sermon. How to listen to a sermon. Number one, expect God to speak. Listen with expectancy. It's God's word and he will speak to you if you come with faith, with expectancy to hear God speak. Number two, I urge you to read the passage the night before. Actually, let the scripture start soaking through your thoughts um, so that when you come to church, you've got some level of familiarity with the passage that's going to be preached on. Number three, pray. Yes, pray for understanding of the word as it's preached and the God the Holy Spirit will help you to understand the word. So expect God to speak, read passage early, pray for understanding of the word as it's preached. Number four, rest well before you come to church so you can come fresh on Sunday morning. Uh, I sometimes see emails sent at 2.30am and I think, wow, okay, I bet I'd be pretty sleepy uh, coming to church the next Sunday. You know, Go to bed earlier on a Saturday night so you can come to church fresh. Number five, listen with your Bible open. Listen with your Bible open. Your Bible, your personal Bible. Not your phone. Your Bible with the paper and the pages in it. And listen with a pen or a pencil. Okay, I'm really distracted because I've got a new Bible. My own Bible's fallen to bits and it's full of notes and scratchings and ideas and I, and I still have to go back to it because it's kind of like... Oh, it's hard to cut over to a new Bible um, because it's so full of all my thoughts and ideas and sermons that I've heard. Have a paper Bible and write in it. Listen with a pen or a pencil or a notebook. And remember, even in the sermon outlines, you can take notes there. Take notes to help you learn. And then finally, apply whatever it is that God has taught you. Okay, you're going home. What have you learnt? Again, in the sermon outline, underneath the conclusion, there's a box. It's not there just to fill up the page with empty space. It says something I have learnt today, something I can pray for, something I should do. Okay, well, you've heard the sermon preached. Uh, the application is to listen, looking for how to learn. Are you going to write something? Are you going to take something home that you can learn to do? Did you learn anything? What was it that you learned? Is there something you should pray for? Someone you should pray for? Who is it? And what does God want you to do in the week ahead? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful passage. Help us to live in your truth as your people today. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to finish with our final song, music team, and if uh, Yin can close the service, thank you.